Cruzero, Regional Sales Manager for Canada at Atlona. Thank you for joining us this evening for our live audience. And thank you for joining us this afternoon for our virtual audience, depending on where you're attending from. Uh, today we have a very special presentation for you on Atlona Control and AV over IP and LG as well. And with that, I'm going to pass it along to my colleague, Justin Kennedy, our product manager on Atlona Control. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Good. All right. We're going to spend a little bit of time just uh, briefly talking about our control platform with it. Is that better? Okay. Good. Uh, so, first off, uh, our control platform is called Velocity. Um, and it's a little bit different than the typical control platform that you typically might be familiar with. There are three main pillars of Velocity. Uh, the first is control. Um, that is your standard control that you would typically expect with uh, controlling third-party equipment, controlling at LONA equipment, uh, integration with other devices, uh, touch panel user interfaces, scheduling, uh, and also we support a very nice subset of uh, asset management as well. So three main pillars are control, scheduling, and on the scheduling side, this is Office 365. Uh, for those that might still have uh, an existing uh, exchange on-premise server, uh, that is also supported on the scheduling platform, as well as the uh, Ad Astra for higher education. And we'll be adding additional uh, scheduling platforms to the tool as we kind of move forward. Uh, the third piece and the third pillar to Velocity is our asset management piece, as I mentioned. Uh, what that means is you have the ability to manage all of the different devices in the system. Uh, you can check the status of the devices. You can load firmware and update firmware to the Atlona devices uh, in bulk. So instead of touching one device at a time, you can actually uh, create uh, a schedule uh, on the firmware download to be able to transmit that firmware to multiple devices at the same time. Um, likewise, we also support the ability for username and password management. So for example, an IT department has uh, specific requirements for changing the password on IT devices every 90 days. Uh, Velocity will let you ch bulk change those passwords uh, however you might need to do so. So three main pillars, everybody got that? Control, scheduling, and management. Uh, so that is the three main pillars of Velocity. Now what I do want to mention is that beyond those three options inside of the tool, now keep in mind this is all inside of one platform and one tool, uh, we also support some additional functionality. Uh, for example, we have thousands and thousands of drivers in our driver database. This is the drivers that are used to communicate with the third party pieces of equipment. That's what's going to give you the, the control and the interaction and the integration when you're actually combining the systems together. Uh, so that being said, um, there is actually uh, a, a built-in driver creation tool inside of the application. Uh, so yes, we create drivers. Yes, uh, normally we have a, a pretty good turnaround time to get those. But if you're in a pinch and you need to write your own driver, the tool will actually let you create your own driver inside of the application. So I also want to talk a little bit about deployment because this is slightly different than maybe what you would typically expect from a normal control platform. Um, our deployment is not a one-to-one -one ratio. So what do I mean by that? One controller per room, for each room. That is typically how control systems are installed and, and applied inside of an application. We support on the hardware side a three-room gateway, a 10-room gateway, and a 20 room gateway. And so you are not fixed to a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, I, I will also mention we do have an option for one-to-one. -one. It's called our VTPG 1000. It's a 10 inch touch panel that actually has a built-in control processor in the panel. How can we do that? Well, the entire platform is all IP based. Uh, what does that mean? So when you look at one of our hardware controllers, there are no control ports 
on a hardware controller. So typically, if you look at a control system, you'll see the uh, you'll see uh, RS-232 ports. You'll see relay ports. You'll see IR ports. We don't have any of that on our systems, which is why we are uh, able to actually scale and virtualize the way that we can. So we use what's called a velocity control converter, and the velocity control converter will actually convert that IP signal to the legacy control, RS-232, IR, or relay. With all of the functionality that we've added into the application on the hardware side, the other option for deployment is what's called virtualization. So we actually allow you to run on uh, enterprise grade uh, equipment. You can run uh, VMware's ESXi on a virtual machine, and you can run uh, Velocity also on Microsoft Hyper-V. Uh, that gives you the flexibility to start at 20 rooms, and you can then add additional rooms to that platform as the system grows. Uh, so a lot of flexible ways that you can deploy the system, whether it's a hardware-based, whether it's software-based on a virtual machine, or even a hybrid where you've got an application using both virtualized application uh, as well as the hardware application. Everybody make sense? Okay, so what we're gonna do for the next little bit is we're gonna actually dive into the software and I'm gonna show you how to build a system and I'm gonna show you some of the neat things that the application can do and I'll start with the dashboard. So on this dashboard, I have what's called my Explorer view. This is the view of all of the different rooms throughout my system. If I have multiple gateways, let's say it's a, a six floor uh, education facility and we've got uh, classrooms on each of, the, each of the six floors, I can have six different gateways. Those six gateways can then be linked together and I can view those gateways and those rooms of all of those gateways on this one pane of glass, this one dashboard. Um, it makes it really simple to be able to go in to configure and to edit however you might need to do so, uh, all from a single location. The gateway information here on the right side, this is gonna give you information about the room, the devices, the connection status, uh, and these are all hardwired links. And so if, for example, I bring up my dashboard and it tells me that I have devices online, I can click that link and it will take me directly into my asset management tool that can then help me troubleshoot why, am I, why, why do I have a device down, what's going on in the system. Uh, this is here also the place that I can configure the devices for Atlona, I can update firmware, and I can update my username and password information. The last item that I wanna show you on the dashboard is what's called our real-time status indicators. So as you can see, we have uptime, memory usage, CPU usage, and disk usage. Has anyone ever programmed a DSP? Okay, yep, a couple of you. So kind of keep in mind, it's very similar to how a DSP works. When you add levels or channels or gains on a DSP, there is a an indicator that's telling you how much processing is being taken up by that particular configuration file. Uh, we're doing the exact same thing here. We're telling you how much memory is being used by the system, how much processing is being used by the number of macros or the number of variables, or the number of conditionals that you built into the application. And of course, disk usage gives you the, the finite amount of disk space that's available on your system. Now, why is this important specifically if you're talking about a virtual machine and you're on room 36, you're getting ready to add 12 more rooms and you check your dashboard, your memory usage is covering right around 70 or 75%. This gives you a good clear indication that you need to add additional memory to the, to the virtual machine or add additional processing cores to the virtual machine. So it does give you that real time data that you can gauge to make sure that the system is performing uh, the way that it should. So we're gonna jump into a room. Uh, I've got several rooms that are already pre-built out. If you were building a room in Velocity for the first time, on this page here, this is our equipment page, our device list page. Uh, you can see I've got devices that I've already added to the system. If it's a new system, there's gonna be a big plus button. This big plus button, you click it and it's actually going to open up our driver database. So as I go into this, we could have all different kinds of equipment that are supported. You can add your own drivers. As I mentioned, right, there's the create driver that would take you to that page to create the driver. Uh, but let's just say we want to put in a really nice LG display in this application. So we'll do a search and the LG devices will appear in this search. 
If I'm building out, for example, a video wall, I'm going to use the commercial uh, that's going to give me the TCP control or IP control. If I'm building out a video wall with these displays and I have a three by three, instead of actually clicking add nine times, I can just simply increase the number of displays that I'm adding to the system and click the add button. And what that's going to do is going to add all nine of those displays at the same time into my device list on this page here. So as you can see, I've added some devices already in advance, so no problem. Uh, what, I do, what I do want to let you know is that for each of the devices, you're going to go into the settings and you're going to set the communication parameters. In this case, this is controlled over IP through WebSocket. I'm going to set the IP address and the port on how I'm going to communicate to that specific device. On a switcher page, for example, all of the switchers that you add to Velocity will give you the ability to select both the inputs and the outputs on the switcher. Basically, how is the switcher wired? And in this case, because I've already added the source equipment, this will provide me with a dropdown that will then give me the available sources that I've added into the system. So you can see all of my sources there. I'm going to select the USB input for this source. I'm going to change this to a friendly name. This is what the user will see when they are using the touch panel. And I also can create uh, or add a custom icon to this button. So in this case, we're using Material I.O. icons. If you're familiar with those, you basically support all of the ones that are available. If you don't want to use our Material I.O. icons, you can absolutely import your own icons into the system and customize this uh, however you might like to choose to do so. I'll do the same thing for my other inputs. I'll set my camera and my HDMI 3 input. My wave will be on HDMI 4 and then BYOD on HDMI 5. Again, change the alias so that it's user friendly and select the icons that I want to be displayed on the touch panel. On the output side, I'm only using one output even though this switcher supports two. And in the drop down, it will be the available inputs on that LG display. So I select the HDMI input. I also want to control my volume through the line level output of the switcher. So from here, I'm going to select what I'm controlling, how I'm controlling that volume. The master volume is going to be controlled on this switcher, and that will automatically assign my volume controls inside of my configuration. So I'll click my Save button, and I'll close my window. And this is where you would think that I'm going to ask you to stay with me for six to eight hours this evening. Is everybody okay with that? We're going to learn to write program code for Velocity. I know some of you guys are already uh, writing program code and you're, you're already uh, programmers and you understand how to write code. Uh, most control system code differs by manufacturer. So we're going to teach you a completely new set of code for Velocity, right? Everybody in? Who's in? Who's in? All right, we're not going to do that. Uh, Velocity doesn't force you to write any custom code at all. There is no custom code that you have to write whatsoever. In fact, creating the simple inputs and outputs that we did on the switcher actually generates a completely functional system in about 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the amount of equipment that you're adding to the system. So this is the user interface. This user interface is what we call our default or our template one user interface. Uh, it allows me to, uh, there is some customization that can be done like colors, as I mentioned, icons on the buttons uh, and text. Now the layout is fixed. This layout is going to give me my sources. And in this case, I only have one display, but as I select the source, you'll see that my output is displayed. It's giving me feedback on the panel as to which source is selected. And if I have a control device, it will actually also bring up a control page for that particular device. So in this case, I bring up my camera control. I can uh, pre -reset, uh, pre uh, recall presets. I can pan, tilt, zoom, focus. Uh, basically, all of the basic functions or standard functions that that device supports, it's automatically built and generated for me. Now, what does that mean? That means that I can build a system out in 15, 20, 30 minutes, and it's fully functioning, right? Yes, absolutely. We also respect and understand that not everyone is going to want a default UI. There are certain installations where we need to match an existing look and feel of a touch panel. We need to match corporate branding, the university logos. And so this may not necessarily be the solution for every single project. That being said, we also have created a tool inside Velocity called our custom UI design tool. And I've created a, a touch panel that uses a custom UI designer 
And inside of this panel, you can see that I've created some custom buttons, some custom pages, custom icons. Basically, you are building this system out from a graphical and functional perspective. Uh, I'll say one button at a time, right? So you, uh, one button at a time. Uh, what does that mean? So if I go to my main sources page, I've got a button here that I've already created. I'm going to delete that button so that we can recreate it. Uh, but you can see here I've got several different sources. It's exactly the same types of sources that I used before. I threw a Blu-ray Blu logo in just for, for, to make it a little bit different uh, than the default UI. But this is, uh, this is the layout. Um, I can create a button very simply and very easily by going to my Components tab and selecting a solid button and clicking Create. This now gives me the ability to edit this button. So let's make it nice. Let's go into the style. Let's label this button. Uh, we're going to label this preset to, and we'll make this a camera preset. Now the text that's going to show up in the middle of the button, I'm actually going to lower that to the bottom. So that looks good. I like the way that looks there. I'm just going to leave the white text. Of course, you can change the colors as you need to. Uh, for my default icon, we're going to pick the Ethernet button. So that will actually set up our icon for this. There's our icon that's going to show up. Um, you can also change the shadowing, the border options, the opacity. There's also a really nice feature that's called button overlay. So for example, if it's a room off button, I can actually create that button and I can add that button to multiple pages. Every button, every page that I assign that button to will uh, replicate that button exactly. Meaning I can create the functionality of the button one time and use it on any page across my entire panel. All right, so now we're actually going to build the functionality of that button. So I'll go to my Actions tab. You'll see here I've got the ability for macros, navigation, systems tied to variables, and conditions. So I did mention conditions and variables earlier. Yes, if you have a divisible air wall and it's triggering a sensor, that sensor, uh, can we can create a variable based off that sensor status. And then we can create a condition that will allow us to hide and show different buttons on the UI based off of the status of that button. We can also change colors of buttons. We can change pages. There's really limitless amount of things that you can do based off of uh, a conditional tied to a variable inside of the application. So I won't go too deep into that. It can get a little complicated, but I'm just letting you know from the programming perspective, if you're used to writing code and you're used to writing FL statements, this also supports the ability to do that just without having to write the code. All right, so now I'm going to add some very simple functions into this preset. Uh, first, I'm going to go in, add a macro button. Um, this macro button, I'm going to select my camera, and all of the functions of the camera will now appear in the drop down. Um, if you create your own driver for a display device and you have power on, power off, and one input, those are the three items that you will see here inside of that drop-down list. So in this case, I'm just going to recall preset number two, and that button is completely done. I actually have the ability to click the play button here, and I can test that macro. Is it doing what it's supposed to do? Um, I also can launch a virtual control UI, and I can test the virtual control through uh, my browser, should I choose to do so. You don't have to have a physical touch panel in place, and you can see there I've launched the panel, and I can click that button, and then I can check my logs and make sure that I'm sending out the right command and that the, the feedback is coming back and so on and so forth. So pretty good, pretty, pretty simple, pretty easy. What if I want to create pages without having to create one button at a time? Well, that's where we will use what's called our panel widgets. In this case, I'm going to add a second camera. This is camera two. I'm adding a new page there. This will be a blank page on my canvas. And now I can go into my panel widgets and I can look for my camera panel widget, and I can click this, and it will populate the standard camera functions with buttons automatically for me in this, uh, in this UI. Now, it's a complete graphical representation of a uh, fairly standard camera control. I can then go back in and edit the buttons, move the buttons, hide the buttons, show the buttons. And if I'm building out, for example, a cable TV tuner, and I don't want to manually create the buttons, I can select the buttons that I don't need. For example, I know I'm going to need the, the cursor, and I can actually use these for anything I want. It doesn't have to be a camera. So this can now be on a DVD cursor page uh, where I can do certain things that would allow me to uh, customize or create custom UI pages without having to individually create each of the buttons. 
So quite a bit of uh, functionality that you can do in this. Uh, I definitely wanted to give you guys uh, a very brief and quick overview of Velocity. Uh, for those that have not seen it before, there's a lot more that you can do with this application. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions uh, throughout the evening as you guys think of them or come across them. And in the meantime, I will pass over to Paul Prezan. Thank you guys for your time. Thanks, Justin. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, as, as Justin mentioned, my name is Paul Prezan. I'm uh, Lona's product manager for our network AV products, um, which includes our OmniStream uh, portfolio. And so I'm going to give you a brief overview of the product line as it exists today. And I'm going to tell you about the great new features that we have coming in our 2.0 firmware update. So if you're not familiar with our OmniStream line, uh, it's a network AV product that we've had in the market actually since about 2017. Uh, we've got more than 17,000 endpoints installed, so it's really a field-proven, you know, tried-and-true, uh, robust uh, network AV platform. And it's comprised of encoders, uh, decoders, and USB over IP um, endpoints. And so I'll show you what those SKUs look like here in a minute. Um, but first, I wanted to give you a little bit of an insight into uh, sort of the design philosophy that we have for OmniStream. There's different takes on network AV products. And uh, our approach to this was, uh, first of all, I should mention it's a gigabit network device. Um, and we uh, really had as a, a high priority for us that we have pristine video quality. So that's always been a design fundamental. So we support 4K60 video and we use the VC2 codec, which was a codec um, developed by the BBC and then they open sourced it. In addition to having great video quality, it gives us really low latency, which makes it great for conference rooms, classrooms, anywhere where you're doing a presentation and there's a certain amount of latency sensitivity. Uh, the second fundamental that we had was reliability. Now the hardware itself is quite reliable. Um, again, it's been field proven, uh, but it wasn't just about having reliable hardware. We wanted to make sure that you could get your content from encode to decode reliably. So we were one of the first pro AV suppliers to include forward error correction. Uh, and as well as redundancy features. So you can define primary streams and backup streams. And so that's just gonna give you a certain amount of protection against packet loss, whether it's due to switch congestion, uh, broken cable, uh, disconnected cable, switch failure, anything like that. Also security is a huge uh, priority for this product line. In addition to having the normal network protocol security we would expect like 802.1X and uh, all the secured network interfaces, we encrypt all of our streams which is critical to, for supporting HTCP, uh, but it also allows us to offer, you know, customers a guarantee that their content is private on the network. One of the things that we do also do that's unique in OmniStream is you can do per stream encryption keys so that essentially if somebody, if you have a, you know, an installation throughout your facility and you have encoders and decoders, but you say, you know what, some of these encoders are carrying sensitive content and I don't want just any decoder to be able to, to play that content back you can actually encrypt those streams uniquely. Um, so in terms of what the product line actually looks like today, so we have a couple of different encoder models. We have our Omni 111 single channel encoder. So this is just HDMI in and network out. Uh, we also have our dual channel encoder. Now for a lot of our customers, a dual channel encoder is really about getting uh, encode density. Um, it's the same size box, but you essentially can have two separate uh, encodes. But we, uh, because everything is connected internally, we're actually able to um, enable other functionality. For example, you can configure it as a two input, one output uh, encode device. Or if you're you know, really gonna go into a mission critical redundant application, you can take one input source and stream it out two different network interfaces. So there's a, a number of different ways you can make use of that encoder. We also have our Omni 111 wall plate encoder, which is basically just the 111 wall plate and a two gang uh, 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 wall plate form factor. And then we also have our Omni 121, which is our single channel decoder. So network AV in and HDMI out. And there's a lot of features and capabilities. Um, and I touched on uh, some of those earlier. A few other ones that I wanna mention specifically is we do have AES 67 support built in. So if you're building out a network AV system, but you need the audio to become part of a DSP or other distributed audio system, you can send audio, a uh, separate audio channel out AES67. Uh, we also um, 
Mechanically, I want to mention the design. All these units have a front to rear airflow, which means you can stack them up in a rack. You can put them behind a display that's really close to a wall. You don't have to worry about any kind of airflow concerns or considerations. So with that dual channel encoder, you can put two of them side by side in a rack and get four encodes in one, uh, in one rack unit. The other two products in the portfolio are our USB over IP devices. So these are our Omni 3XX products. And we're seeing just a rapid uptake on these as more and more people are using uh, USB peripherals as part of their UC implementations. So this is a full USB 2.0 product. Uh, you can use it point to point as a USB extender, but when it gets really powerful is when you put it on the network because you can take up to seven of those 324s and connect it to a 311 host device that's connected to your PC. And it's all under API control. So we see this getting used a lot in divisible spaces where you might have multiple cameras in a room all connected to their own 324. When I have the room combined, they're all routing back to one PC. Then when I divide the room, I can have my control system basically reconfigure and send the devices on one side to the host in that room and the devices on another side to a host in that room. So we're seeing lots and lots of uptake uh, with this device. So this is all the product that we that we have today and sort of the state that it's it's in today. Uh, what I really wanted to get a chance to preview to you uh, today, though, was our new OmniStream 2.0. So this is something that we um, announced at ISE this year, and it's going to be available in May. And this is a firmware update for our existing hardware. So all of that hardware going back to 2017 can be upgraded and get all this great new uh, functionality. We're really committed to making sure that our customers have sort of a continuity of experience um, uh, with their hardware. So the biggest part of this that's new is we're bringing a new codec into the platform. So I mentioned at the beginning that we use VC2, which is a fantastic codec, but it's um, compression efficiency is such that you really can't do 4K6444 on a gigabit network. So today, respect to 4K6420. With our new VCX codec, you'll be able to do 4K6444 on a gig. And the one kind of asterisk there is that wall plate, we're gonna have to maintain our old resolution spec just for thermal reasons, because it's in a wall that's potentially insulated. Now, one of our other big design parameters for this new codec was that it be optimized for computer content. So with this codec, computer content is indistinguishable from the source. You can put a laptop up on a screen directly or you can run it through the system and there's basically no difference between the two. And um, the, the, the encoders essentially um, look at the content coming in and on the fly make modifications to how they're encoding. So even though it'll look really great with computer content, it also looks really fantastic with motion video uh, content. Uh, we further reduced the latency. So we were at about a half a frame before, we're now less than half a frame. It's a little bit academic because it half a frame of latency, it's hard for anyone to even see that. But the point is we, we continue to make you know, additional improvements with this codec. We can also now support 4K60 fast switching. We used to be limited to 1080p. So you can now essentially switch within a frame between one stream to the next. And the other really exciting thing, I think for some of our customers with VCX isn't necessarily gonna be the 4K6444 support as much as it's gonna be the bandwidth improvements they get at other resolutions uh, because of the in increased compression we're getting with VCX. So we've talked to a lot of customers who talk to us about their uplink bandwidth challenges when they're building large scale network AV systems. How many streams can I get on a 10 gig uplink? And they're using 1080p or they're using 4K6420. And with VCX, um, as you can kind of see up there, we're gonna take 4K6420 from what is an eight or 900 meg signal in Omni today down to 300 meg. So now you're getting a lot more uplink uh, efficiency with this codec. Second big feature we're adding with this um, uh, with this firmware update is encoder dual streaming. So today our solution has scaling on the decode side, and we'll still have that with 2.0, but on the encode side, we're actually adding two scalers into the encoder, two independent scalers, and you can stream two copies of the same input source at two different resolutions and two different bit rates. Now there's a couple of applications for this. One is, Again, back to bandwidth management. If I'm doing a large scale system, maybe I wanna do 4K60 in the room where everything is home run to the same switch, but I can have a secondary 1080p stream that I'm gonna send out my uplink to other switches 
So I have essentially reduced bandwidth across my, my LAN. The second use case I'm going to introduce here in a little bit when I talk about another cool feature where we really need this uh, dual streaming capability. We're also adding in encoder thumbnails. So it's a, a big requested feature on people's touch panels to be able to let users pick the source by the content that's on the source. And so now every two seconds, our encoder will essentially snapshot what's being encoded. And it will, it will create a JPEG image, which can then be put on a touch panel, or you can build a dashboard. It essentially allows you to monitor the sources in the system. And then the third, the fourth sort of really exciting part of the 2.0 firmware update is our support for decoder multi-view. So with decoder multi-view, we're essentially going to take multiple streams of content off the network and composite them in the decoder without requiring any additional equipment. So now this is really good if you need to do a quad or a hip or a side-by-side. -side. You can now pick up multiple streams off the network and render them on that decoder without needing a windowing processor. Now there's a couple of constraints to make all of this work. The first constraint is we still only have a gigabit network connection. So all the streams coming in have to be less than a gig. That's part of why we added those scalers into the end couple for my for my multi-view, I may need a second stream that's at a lower resolution and a lower bit rate. And also the incoming streams have to be at the resolution that they will be displayed at on the screen. Um, the decoder itself does not have a per stream scaler in it. So whatever resolution comes in is what will be shown. And I'll show you in a minute a little bit of what that means from a design standpoint. But I think sometimes it helps to kind of see this in action and understand what you can do with it. Now, we weren't able to bring in a full multi-view system in here today. So what we did instead is we created a multi-view demo video so that you can see it running. And I'm just going to change over to our streaming platform. Hello, I'm going to give you a brief demonstration of the new multi-view capabilities inside OmniStream 2.0. Let's talk briefly about the applications that it's really well suited for. One of my favorites of these is the overflow room scenario where I have a lecturer or a presenter in one room and I have overflow participants in another room. So in this demo here, I've got two displays. Each display has its own decoder. So you could imagine we have room one where the lecturer or the presenter is and room two where the overflow participants are. Now in this case, because each of these displays has a decoder connected, I can send content from the presenter to any of the rooms that has a decoder. Well, with the new multi-view capabilities inside OmniStream 2.0, I can take this even one step farther. If the camera in the room where the presenter is is also connected to an encoder, that now becomes content that can be viewed inside of the overflow room. And with the multi-view capabilities inside of the decoder, I can actually pick up not just the content stream, but also the camera stream and render it on the display. So I can do something like this where I have a picture in picture where I have my content, but I also have my camera view where I can view my lecture. Now with PIP, sometimes you need to be able to move the PIP window around or change its size. And with uh, the multi-view capabilities inside of OmniStream, it's really easy because inside the decoder, we're compositing those streams in real time. And so I can do things like change where my PIP window is located, or by changing the resolution of the incoming stream, I can affect how big the camera image is. But maybe in a slightly different overflow scenario, PIP isn't really the right answer because I, I can't afford to cover any content, or maybe I want the camera image to be a little bit bigger. Well, in this case, I can choose to have my decoder composite those streams as a side by side where I've got my camera and I've also got my content. And then as a, a lecturer or a presenter in the main space, as I'm changing my content on the main screen in the room that I'm presenting in, it's also then available as a window inside of the overflow room. Now let's talk about a second application that MultiView is really well suited for. And that application would be where you need to show four pieces of content on a screen at one time. This could be, for example, inside of a network operations center where I have an operator or operators who need to view content in a fairly dense way. And you can get four pieces of content on a single screen. 
But then if there's other displays in the room where you need to show content in a larger format or a, at a higher resolution, I can also still, uh, via OmniStream, pick that content and send it to those displays. So this has been a brief overview of the new multi-view capabilities inside OmniStream 2.0. So let me explain a little bit about what we were doing in that demo, just to kind of give you a sense of how the, the system works. So uh, you can essentially see that I've got a, a laptop connected to an encoder and I've got a camera connected to an encoder. And each encoder is configured to dual stream at two different resolutions. So I've got the laptop streaming at 4K and at 1080p, and I've got the camera streaming at 1080p, and, and it was actually in that video less than 720p, but the point was it was a much lower resolution. And then on my decoders, if I want to pick up content and show it full screen, or I want full fidelity, highest resolution, I can just pick up that 4K stream off of the laptop and render it sort of full screen. But now in that side-by-side -side view, I took the 1080p stream from the laptop and the 1080p stream from the camera. So part of that's to keep my bandwidth under a gig, but the other reason is because it renders at 1080p on the screen. And so when you do side-by-side, uh, on a 4K display, you need each of those to be 1080p. And then on the, on the PIP application, where I've got my content going full screen, I'm picking up the 4K st stream of the laptop, so it's sort of you know full screen content. And then my camera, uh, the PIP window, is at whatever resolution that second stream is at. And if I wanted to make that PIP window bigger or smaller, I would just change the scaled resolution on the camera uh, encoder. On the quad view example, essentially all my sources are 4K in this application, and I'm just dual streaming 4K and 1080p. Then anywhere I want to show that content full screen, I'm taking up the uh, I'm picking up the 4K stream from the source, and then for the quad view, I'm just picking up four of the different 1080p streams. And again, we're doing this all without any equipment. You do have to kind of work within the design uh, constraints that we have, but uh, we think this is going to be really powerful for a lot of applications. So. Uh, that's a quick overview of OmniStream. Um, if you've got other questions or would like to, to discuss in more detail what we're doing with it, I just would love to talk to you um, after the presentation portion of this. So with this, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Rob, who's going to talk to you about some LG. <laughs> Testing, testing. Do you guys hear me? Yeah, there we go. When I was listening to Justin, I, I'm using the same mic and I'm trying not to get that same feedback. But uh, good afternoon, everyone, or I guess good evening. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, today. Uh, I'm Rob, uh, Rob Daryl, and I'm with uh, LG Electronics uh, Business Development for uh, our direct view line of uh, product. And today we're going to discuss products or displays that are larger than life. But before we get into kind of what we're promoting today, we got to talk a little bit about yesterday. So the first pixel type we're going to discuss is actually uh, DIP. And this is otherwise known as uh, dual inline package or dots in place. It's got a couple of different names or just simply different. Uh, but essentially what this is, is um, three bolts, kind of like your light bright from when you were a kid. Um, uh, so three, a red, green, blue put together to create one pixel. Uh, it has limitations, of course, because of the size of the pixel. Uh, it's really, it was predominantly used for and still used today uh, for you know billboards, distance viewing. Uh, viewing angles were limited. Uh, it's a phone here, all right. And um, uh, wide pitch options. It also had a rough surface. So, Perfect example, you know, an older billboard, 
Uh, you also see it in stadiums, some arenas. It's an older style technology. Uh, one of the benefits, though, of the, of the product was uh, its ability to go very, very bright. Uh, so that was really one of the benefits of this product. But again, limitations, outdoors only, for that matter. Today, we've got technology called SMD, or Surface Mount Diode. Uh, and what this is, is a red, green, blue chip applied to um, uh, an individual diode package. And uh, with this technology, it is uh, visually far more smoother than, uh, than DIP. And uh, I've got a, a small sample. This is on the, on, on the left side. That's SMD technology, uh, as we're looking at both of them here. Uh, so it's got a smoother, but when you, when you apply your hand to it, it's got a little bit of a sandy surface. But with this technology, we are able to go a lot tighter uh, pitch. Um, and uh, because of that, now we're going indoors with this product. And I think today we're sub one millimeter with, with SMD technology. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see it, but uh, on the presentation there, you'll see there's also single and multi uh, uh, four in one package type SMDs. And uh, it's exactly that. So uh, single would be a red, green, blue inside one diode package. Multi would be red, green, blue, multiple times over. And that's actually the product we've got here. It's called an IMD package. It's a little bit more durable than SMD, so we're cheating a little bit. But uh, essentially, it's all surface mount diode where the diode is applied right to the printed circuit board and is raised right above it. So again, it has that, that rough surface. Uh, SMD today is mainstream. So, you know, a few years back, it was cutting edge technology. Today, it's mainstream. You see it everywhere, although we don't see it in this building. Um, uh, you're seeing it, you know, airports, you're seeing it. You're seeing it inside schools, uh, inside banks, uh, even house of worship. You know, when a church gets a direct ULED, you know the product's mainstream. Um, this presentation is um, as tighter pixel pitches become more affordable, so what we're seeing and why it's becoming mainstream, tighter pixel pitches are becoming more affordable, so obviously sales are increasing as a result of that. Um, a few years ago, I remember even you know a simple 130-inch direct view display in a full HD uh, configuration, maybe had an MSRP of about $150,000. Today, you know, we're less than half of that price. So obviously the uh, the product is far more attainable today than it was a few years ago. We also have greater options of product selection. So, you know, uh, SMD, we've got the option to go with gold leads, copper leads. You can get it in curves. We go indoors, outdoors, hybrid in window, uh, inside corners, outside corners, different size of cabinets. And obviously the, the multitude of pixel pitches ranging from, as I mentioned, sub one millimeter all the way up to you know 16 plus millimeters. So there's a, there's a ton of options in market and not just from ourselves, uh, there's a ton of competition in the space as well, which is also you know bringing the cost down. And then kits. So two or three years ago, we came up with a, a simple to uh, deploy, simple to purchase, simple to install kit. And in this kit contains everything you need to have a full HD 136 inch wall it up in two hours. So it's um, uh, well-priced, again, simple to deploy. And if I think about it, as I mentioned in those price points, four or five years ago, you know, we may only have sold, you know, a handful of these per year. Today, this product's going out weekly and, and multiples. Uh, so that's, again, talking about how the product has become mainstream. So what's next? Well, the reality is next is, is now. Uh, and let me introduce our third pixel type, and that's chip on board. Not to be confused with another terminology called uh, GOB or glue on board. That technology is actually a resin applied to, um, uh, to the diodes themselves to offer some protection. Chip on board, so what it is, it's, it's micro LED. Uh, your RGB is bonded directly to your printed circuit board. So. This product allows for the highest contrast, your highest durability, and offers a very, very smooth surface. Hard to tell by, by this, but I've got chip on board product on the right side of our sample here. And to give you a, a, 
a comparison in terms of size of pixel. So micro LED is essentially the, the width of a human hair. We compare that to OLED product, you know, we're about five, six times that, that width. And SMD product, with the product on the right, you're looking at 10 times that size. So as tiny as those pixels are, micro LED is, again, the size of a human hair. So in addition to, um, in addition to the product itself, you know, being micro, what we do to the product uh, to, uh, I guess, enhance it, you would say, uh, we apply a, uh, an adhesive film. We add, we add a colorless polymid, which, which acts really as, its temp as a tempered glass. We add a black film to the product, so it gives a really, really deep black. Well, actually, when the product's turned off, you'll see the clear difference between the two products, how deep the blacks are on, uh, on our product named Magnet on the, uh, on the right there. Uh, we add an anti-reflection coating. We add also an anti-fingerprint coating. And it's actually not really anti-fingerprint. You can actually get fingerprints on the product. However, it's designed in a way that those fingerprints come easily off with a microfiber block. So also with micro LED, we also have the benefit, since these are really, really tiny pixels, we get a lot more black area around uh, the product itself. More black area, more contrast, um, and uh, uh, you get a, a finer picture quality. And now compare that with SMD, and I know we're showing here 59% black area with SMD, I actually think it's less than that, uh, because with, with a tighter pixel pitch, you're getting very, very little black area. and in comparison, also when we talk about the, the colors, or rather uh, uh, black levels, the, uh, the diodes on an SMD product they're not exactly black; they're gray. So again, when this product is completely black, you'll see that it's, it's actually a very dark gray. So uh, black levels are nowhere near anywhere near where Chip on Board is today. And let's talk about durability. So we tested our product. Uh, and it's able to take an impact of 21 joules. So that's taking a three kilogram ball, dropping it from 70 centimeters, uh, and it actually has a, an IK10 rating. I'm gonna step away quickly from the camera. That it is, it is one hell of a durable product. Uh, very important in public spaces, very important for the longevity of, uh, of products, uh, again, especially in, in spaces. Now, you know, with surface mount diode product, over time, people can pick away at it. People, especially in public places, you might even see diodes being knocked out. But with chip on board, it's far superior when it comes to durability. So I mentioned the benefits of chip on board. Um, contrast ratios. So I think we're running our product 150,000 to one. It's incredibly high contrast ratios. Uh, OLED light black levels. So if you've ever seen an OLED, I'm sure everyone here has seen an OLED, uh, whether you've got a, an OLED TV at home or you walk you know, through, through your local Best Buy, the black levels in OLED are just incre incredibly deep black. And we have that exact same experience, uh, experience with Magnet here. Uh, accurate, vibrant uh, colors, and that's actually from any angle as well. Uh, finest pixel pitches. We're now down to 0.7 millimeters in terms of pixel pitch. So we're because of the micro LED technology, we're able to get those pixels even smaller. I mentioned already extremely durable and then obviously easy to clean. But with SMD, think about it, you know, the, the, the pixels are raised, so it's going to collect dust over time. And, and we recommend, you know, it, it gets a cleaning once a year, and that, that involves blowing the dust out of the diodes. With magnet, as I mentioned, it is, uh, it is a simple, easy clean with a microfiber. So what's the current challenge with, with chip on board? You're obviously all thinking the same thing. It's price. It is a very expensive technology. You lost one side. But anyway, you can see the black levels. Um, current challenge with, with chip on board is, uh, is price, but that's changing. You know, as we sell more product, as more competition comes into the space, sales go up, and this is advancing without me doing anything. Um, and uh, you know, sales increase, uh, we get more product out there, uh, cost of manufacturing comes down, more options become, you know, come to market. Um, and then as, as kits come available as well, we're gonna see this product come down in price. Uh, and just as SMD technology was four or five years ago, we expect the same will be for chip on board three, four, five years from now. 
but I kind of have a future pricing outlook that'll be kind of similar to the price of gas, where your where your value SMD is is set at one price, your premium uh, SMD will be 10, 15 percent more, and then your chip on board will be another 10 to 15 percent above that. Uh, so that's the level we uh, we expect to get to. How long we get there, you know, it could be two, three, four years, but it's it's definitely in the foreseeable future. So with that, let me discuss our lineup. So only a couple of years ago, we had one product in the lineup, and that was a that was a 0.9 product. Uh, then we launched a 1.2, and we launched recently a 0.7. And we've got a line uh, for commercial. Uh, and uh, which ranges from 0.7 to 1.2. Uh, we're launching also um, uh, LSAQ, which will be offboard power option. Uh, if you see their grayed out, you'll see a 136.2K, and what that is is a kit. Uh, so we're, you know, if we hit the right price point with that kit, it's going to sell like hotcakes. It's going to accelerate uh, chip on board, you know, becoming mainstream. Uh, we're launching another product for professional. I don't have a lot of information on this yet, but it'll also be a 0.9. Uh, we also go inside the home. So if anyone with deep pockets in this room, uh, we've got uh, a, a fantastic 136-inch 4K display that's a 0.7. We have a 118 that's coming, and if you can do the quick math in your head, I can't, but I know it's a 0.6 that's coming. So um, uh, we have a 0.6 residential version that's coming later this year. Uh, and then we've got products dedicated towards the virtual production space. And that's a, that's a growing area. Uh, we've got surface mount diode product already for that space, but we're, we're entering it for uh, chip on board uh, this year. We've got already a 1.5. We've got uh, more models coming. So more availability or more you know, breadth of product is coming for this line. You can almost say we're you know, tripling down on, uh, on chip on board. Uh, this coming year versus the last two or three. Uh, so uh, again, we see this as as a future. So my my last and really final point on this is you know chip on board board mainstream, and you know think about this you know as you're uh, looking at direct view for any of your projects you know if you're working on projects that are year two three down the road yeah price all chip on board today, but keep keep a placeholder for this product, especially if it's in a public space, because again, public spaces, product is, is gonna get damaged over time. Uh, it looks fantastic in, in lobbies. It's also you know, a great solution for uh, close-up viewing. So anything within a few feet, again, even, even a lobby, even a boardroom, there's a lot of use cases for the product. And again, as, it, uh, as we continue to develop the product, as again, more competition comes, uh, it is going to become a mainstream product. So with that, I appreciate your time uh, today, and uh, I think we're going to open it up for questions right now. Thank you.